that time again and we just want to say good morning hope you guys all of you are just having a fantastic day today and uh, wherever you are may god bless you whatever you're going through may you be blessed may today you know that you are blessed because of the work that god has already done for you and on your behalf that stuff that will last forever and eternity is how long it will take for god to show you how much he loves you but uh, we want you to be encouraged today. We want to honor God's word today and uh, let us know that you're here in the comments. Say hello to everybody. You know, share this if you want. Um, write us in the comments. Let us know how we can pray for you today and uh, how we can encourage you. And, and again, we hope this message will truly bless your life, truly honor God's word. And may you thoroughly be blessed today in the name of Jesus. Even now, we love you all.
Well, good morning, family, friends. We hope that you are all just having a fantastic day today. Whatever the weather's doing outside, we still hope that you're blessed and knowing that you are blessed wherever you are today. So we want to start this message today with our mission statement that we use every Sunday because we like it, all right? And uh, if you want to say it with us, I'll put it up here on the screen. It says, we are a community transformed by God's grace to bear fruit because we are are the church. I think that's such a beautiful statement, and uh, and I think it's true that we are a community. We are covered by God's grace, and that that is to bear fruit, to have changed lives, because we are the church. You know, it's the body of Christ, and uh, we're going to continue today with our series that Anna Ritter started last week called Promises, as we sort of uncover, dissect, discover, you know, the promises of God, the things that He says, so where we can put our trust and our hope and learn more about God through these things. When, when all else fails, you know, when we look to God, we're looking to the things He told us and we're looking to His promises. And that's where how our, how our faith grows. And so our main tech for this series for promises, all right? Everybody say promises. And you, you've probably had people make promises to you that they failed. You've probably had other people stab you in the back. You've made, you know, from companies to organizations, they didn't honor their word or, or, you know, all kinds of situations that we face where people didn't honor sort of their word, was it bond with you? We know what this is. And sometimes we take that back to God and we think, well, then will God honor his word? But we're here today to say that God will honor his word, that uh, while everything else in this world changes, I mean, we change, the earth changes, and it seems to be going through some mega changes right now. And all these situations that we face, but God never changes. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we know that he is a God of love and he cares about you. And he is reaching into this earth to grab us. And he gives us his promises so that we can trust in him back. So again, our main text is Romans 4. Roman, this is over the whole series, promises. Romans chapter 4, verses 20. 21, all right? We like that because everybody wants to get out of 2020, right? And we're going towards 2021. We don't know what's on the other side over there, but uh, we know that God's promises are always present for us and waiting for us everywhere we look. And so it says, Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. That's a beautiful thing. In fact, his faith grew stronger. It says, and in this, he brought glory to God. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promised. And that is such a beautiful thing to know that God can and will do everything that he has promised. And today is about that, how God is fulfilling, has been fulfilling promises he made all the way back in the days of Abraham for us. And may we today not ever waver or doubt on the promises of God. And through that, our faith will grow stronger and we will bring glory back to God. Not glory to ourselves, not glory to them and all this other stuff going on, but we will give glory to God as our faith grows because we are trusting and we are believing in the promises of God himself. And so from last week, Ritter said this statement that I'm going to include here. It says, hold on to God's promises so that we can know him better and trust him more. This is sort of the main point that we want to know God more. We don't truly know what God is doing and saying for us and, and that we can trust him more in, in life situations because life is rough, man. These days have been crazy. And where do you put your hope? Where do you put your faith? And we want to put that back into God and the word of God and what God has said to us. So my cliche question of the day is raise your hand if you truly want to be blessed. You want to be blessed? I mean, I want to be blessed. I want our church to be blessed. I want PRCS to be blessed. I want this to be a blessed school year. I want your family to be blessed. I want everybody watching this. I want you to be blessed, filled with joy. I'm just popping at the seams with God in your heart and your life, full of the Holy Spirit. I mean, I just want you to be blessed. But I think, um, you know, it sounds cliche. Because of course, we all want to be blessed. But the real question is kind of like, then what does it truly mean to be blessed? Bless, and that's that's what we're going into today. Like, what what does that actually look like biblically? Because it's not always what other people tell us. You know, what does it mean to be blessed? I know that we you we throw the word blessed around all the time. Like, if your kids get straight A's, you probably say, "What a blessing!" Or you pull into a parking lot and. Plaza Las Americas, or uh, 
Amigo Pueblo or if you're in the North Carolina Haynes Mall or Food Lion and, and, and there's a parking spot that opened up right up at the front door and you're like, man, how good is God? Look at this. And what a blessing. And, and it is to us, you know, and, and the ways of life when it can be so tough. And, or, or if uh, things just work out for you, you know, you got that call, you got that raise, you know, and, and things just went sort of smooth for you. This is when we tend to use the word uh, blessing, you know, or we've been blessed. But there's a lot. I think that when we really get down into this and we say, what does it mean to be blessed? I want to be blessed. The real question is then, what are you seeking? Because let's say it, if you're seeking things that are against what God has said, against his promises, if you're seeking things that will take you the opposite direction, if you're living a, a, a false life, living hypocrisy, adultery, lies, or whatever that goes against what God has said, then you're going to find yourself fighting against the very blessings of God that he's trying to extend to us for us to receive. And so it comes to this major question of what are you seeking today? And so I'm going to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 12, where Ritter was last week. And uh, we're going to flow. I got a couple of texts right through this. We're going to look at the promise that God made to Abraham and how that impacts us right now. And, and hopefully that will be our blessed life. And that will be the blessing that we will grab out and receive. So Genesis 12, 1 says, the Lord said to Abram, leave your country, your relatives, your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. Can you imagine that? That, that sometimes when God speaks to us, wants us to wants to bless us, then he leads us to this place where we're going to have to step out in faith. You're going to have to step out into this. All right. There, there's like a, you're going to have to do something about it, not just sit on your hands. He's He's called you. And imagine Abraham going up to his family like this voice from heaven just spoke to me and wants me to leave. Well, Abraham, where are you going? I don't know. How are you going to get there? I don't know. You don't know exactly where you're going? No. Because sometimes God leads us step by step. Like at a car, in, in a car at nighttime with the headlights on, you know, you just see what you need to see in front of you. And God leads in this kind of direction. So God's going to show Abraham as long as he leaves. So here with blessing, Come, is obedience. You can put these two together. Like if you want to be blessed, there has to be some type of obedience, just like we do with our kids. And what do we tell our kids? Like if you obey, you'll have a surprise someday. Or if you obey and do this, 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 like then there'll come these things. It's just the way it is. And so here with God, the world's blessing sort of hangs on whether or not he's going to leave. Abraham does. Genesis 12, 2 says, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you make you famous, right? At which he is worldwide known in most major religions, Judaism, Christianity, uh, the, the religion of Islam. I mean, all these places they go back and argue about, who do they call him? Father Abraham. And he says, and you will be a blessing to others. And then it comes to our sort of main text of today, Genesis 12, 3, it says, I will bless those who bless you, curse those who treat you with contempt. All families. You know what all means, right? All. It's <laughs> straight up. All the families on earth will be what through you? What, what, fill in that blank. All families on earth will be blessed through you. And I think that's such a huge statement because he stepped out in faith. He obeyed that there was going to come a time that all the Families on earth are going to be blessed. So we already live in that day and time. And so you and I can reach out and grab a hold of this blessing right now. That should give us joy. It should give us life. And so we want to look deeper into what truly is this blessed hope, this, this that was going to come into the world, that was going to be a blessing for all of us so that we can literally look in the mirror and say, I am blessed by God. And I hope that you will be able to say that today. In Genesis 22, 18 says a little bit more about this, it says, in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. It doesn't say in your seeds or in this, in your seed. That means somebody's going to come from you like a descendant way down the line. Okay. And because of that, the whole earth is going to be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. There it is again. You want to be blessed. There has to be obedience. Like you have, but here's the thing. You can't know what to, to obey if you don't know what God has said. 
And you can't know what to trust in if you don't know what promise he gave. And so here comes just like a, a very basic part of our faith to know the word of God and look to his promises. And we can't look to it if we don't know what it said. So here it is in your seed. That means somebody's coming in the future. It's going to bless this entire world because Abraham, you obeyed. And uh, man, we had to put our faith into action through obedience and believe. But God did all this for us. And then the Apostle Paul explains it even deeper because all this just keeps uh, explaining itself throughout history and biblical timeline. Galatians 3.16 says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He, he does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed who is Christ. So the answer to the promise made to Abraham is Jesus Christ himself. The answer that was coming into the world that's going to bless you, bless everybody that's going to take our sin, our shame, everything upon that cross to give us life. Here's the thing. The wages of sin is death, the Bible said. like That means lights out, game over. That means there is nothing after we die except that Jesus raises from the dead, giving us a resurrection. So one of the greatest gifts and what this is always going to be about. See, a lot of times what we, we take the Bible and we put ourselves in the story as if we were David fighting Goliath, you know, uh, even though this is like a major story that is pointing towards Jesus, not pointing towards us. I mean, all the people and David and Goliath were standing on the sideline. I, I can't fight that guy. I'm not fighting that battle. Um, except there was one who was, looked weak who went in and fought in everybody else's place. This is not necessarily about you and I. This is about Jesus Christ. This is pointing that somebody is going to come in to take on the giants of life that you and I don't have the power to do. So Jesus is the fulfillment of that promise coming in to this world to bless us. And that is the truth. That is Bible. That is what this is about. But you and I tend to turn this a lot of times and and what we hear on, uh, you know, television evangelists and, and stuff like that and other, other stuff, I have books, uh, and I hear like when we, you know, they start equating what the blessed life looks like. And that's kind of what I want to go into just for a minute to try to clarify some of this and, uh, and just evaluate. It's just stuff to think about. What does it truly mean to be blessed? Because one of the things we do today is that we think that if we're blessed, by God, then our life will just be easier. Is that not what we do? And, and then what people do in churches when life gets hard, when they lose a family member, when they lose, uh, when cancer shows up or when debt shows up or when this crazy payment shows up that you had no idea debt you owed and, or your kids are misbehaving or COVID-19 shows up in the world, then they think, well, maybe God doesn't love me. Maybe, maybe I'm not blessed by God because life just got difficult. Even though Jesus, who is the fulfillment of that promise, says you will have trouble in this world, but take heart because I have overcome the world. He did that for us so that we could trust in him, the fulfillment of the promise. And we are blessed by that, not just having an easier life. And sometimes what we say, well, a good life is an easy life. That is a blessed life. You know, we're uh, your kids always behave, but is that always the case? You know, where you, your relationship with your spouse, where you just always are living in harmony, which you know this is not the world we live in. We have issues. We have fights. This is not heaven. This is earth, right? Where, where, where we, we die, we suffer, there's pain. And it's even told to us that that would be the case for us here. This is why we have to trust and put our faith in God. And this is why sometimes I get so bummed out when I listen to some other uh, uh, preachers and stuff, when they start talking about being blessed. I listened to these two preachers on TV the other day just while I was doing research for this message, I, and I got really bummed out because I respect one of them, but they were talking about how to be blessed by God. So I was like, hmm, I want to be blessed, right? That's why I'm teaching this. And yet what they started saying is like, well, if you want to be blessed by God, you're going to have to buy my book for $19.99, no money back guarantee. And I was like, oh, no, man, come on, don't do this like that. Now they're looking like charlatans, you know, and it's like you're, you're the, what, selling oil or something like uh, uh, just, just trying to make a buck on it. And then they start talking about like when you're blessed by God, you never have pain. You never suffer. You will always be healthy. You will never, ever be sick. 
and and yet they and they speak that way. And when they are sick, they say, "I'm not sick," and uh, and they can't go get help or get you know declare the truth because uh, because they're living in some sort of denial because they equate God's blessings not with Jesus Christ that's been given to us. They equate it with just like uh, heaven on earth, a utopia where you never have any pain and you're just sort of floating on wings. But we know the reality to that. We know that this, this world is rough and we have to look to God and we have to trust in Him. Then one of these preachers says, if you really want to be blessed by God, send me a check for $1,000. I almost lost my cookies. I was like, eh, get off the TV. I don't even want to hear this. I know that it's more blessed to give then receive. Give with a cheerful heart. But I think that if you send this guy your money, he's just going to be buying a jet plane or something while you are trying to feed your family, you know, and take care of those that your loved ones around you. So I think should be wise, should be smart. The promise doesn't go into what this guy said. The promises go into what Jesus said. And that is what can be trusted. And we need to always look to that. There's a lot to this. So I want to ask you a question. I always have questions for my sermons. When did your faith truly grow the most? This is a good question for talk it over. It's a good question for the comments. It's a good question for you to talk it over with those that are sitting with you now. Seriously, when did your faith grow the most? Because most people is not when everything was peachy and you got everything you wanted because you started spending your time and all those things that you got and what you wanted. And uh, what happens is nine times out of 10, people's faith grow when they are pressed, when they find themselves in the trenches and life just turned into a hurricane. When you find yourself in the battle, when life just threw so much stuff your way and you had to look somewhere for help and God's people showed up and God showed up and he gave you like this little sticker of hope, you know, and a little, like God spoke through a whisper. He spoke in some way, he gave, encouraged you and he led you and it will always lead back to Jesus. It will always go back to him for us to put our trust and hope. But seriously, where did your faith grow the most? I mean, for me, it's always when I find myself in the trenches and I'm struggling and I have nowhere else to turn to fix this, to find a solution because the answer is yes in Jesus. And therefore I turn to heaven and it causes my faith to grow. And what happened to Abraham? He never wavered in believing the promises of God. And as a result, his faith grew. Okay, and that's what we want through this. We trust in God. Our faith grows. And uh, but think about that. When did your faith grow? Was it not when you were challenged? What does James says? Like uh, uh, that how much joy? Consider it pure joy when you face challenges and trials of many kinds, because the testing of your faith develops perseverance, and, and then that takes you on to maturity to the point where it says not lacking anything. You have to be challenged. Have to be tested. And, and here's the thing. We Again, this is not heaven, this is earth, so we will be challenged and we will be tested. And that is a truth. And so, you know, I come to these things like the way the world looks at this sometimes, because does a blessed life equal a successful life? And, and I think no way, not in the eyes of the world. I mean, in the eyes of the world, when they're looking at Jesus on the cross, they say, wow, what a blessed man. What a successful man. Even though he is the blessed one. He is the fulfillment of the promise. He's from heaven coming to earth for you and I. And what he did is going to cause multiplied billions of people to have eternity with God. And that's the most beautiful thing. But from the eyes of the world looking at him, they didn't see success. They didn't look at him. Oh, what a successful thing to go on the cross, even though that is the most successful act in human history. It comes down to how you define it. Would you look at the Apostle Paul? who has led billions to Jesus Christ. I mean, one of the most influential writers ever, you know, in the last 2,000 years, a lot of you probably watching this, like, who's your favorite writer in the scripture? You probably say the Apostle Paul. And yet, Paul getting murdered by the empire, by the Roman Empire, who is going to decapitate him with the eyes of the world, look back at that and say, man, how blessed are you? What a successful life. But he was blessed, man. He was successful. So it comes down to how you define it and how you look at it. You can say the same thing with the Apostle Peter who suffered. Like by some Christian standards today, they would say, well, he wasn't uh, truly blessed by God because he got crucified upside down on a cross beside his wife by the Roman Empire. Would you say that that was blessed? Not in the eyes of the world, but under the eyes of Jesus. That guy is blessed. 
And because of his testimony, man, millions and millions are going to have a and have a relationship now with Jesus because of what these guys did. They are successful and they are blessed, just not in the ways of the world. Because when we start getting things under what other people say, well, when we think we're blessed just because we have, blessed because we have all these things that 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 are just temporary. What leads to is this self-sufficient attitude, you know. Uh, I know what the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day who put Jesus on that demanded, crucified Jesus, the religious number ones, they knew the Old Testament more than anybody else. You know, they're the ones you turn to to get any information about God. And yet these guys, they're the, they were self-sufficient. They had everything they wanted. They were proud. They were arrogant and they became self-righteous. This was their problem. They forgot. What did Jesus say? They, you've forgotten mercy. You know, love, they forgot all the things that matter to God. They, they truly, they thought that they were blessed because they had everything they wanted, not realizing that they missed the actual blessed promise who was Jesus Christ. And I don't want us to miss that just because we have stuff, just because we have a home, because you have a car, because you have all these things. I don't want us to miss Jesus over these things and become proud because I feel like sometimes when I listen to other Christians teach and preach and um and I, and I see some of these mega pastors and stuff that talk about how much you're supposed to have that when you're in the promise of God, he's just going to give, 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 and all, all these things that tend to go into things that won't last. But when God gives and through God's promises, these are things that are very, very much eternal, right? Even the book of Revelation says in Revelation chapter 3, verse 17 is the one I'm going to quote. And uh, this is to this is a hard word, man, to the church of Laodicea, because the book of Revelation was written to the seven churches, and uh, and one of them is Laodicea. This is the lukewarm church, you know, the, because you're lukewarm, I'm about to spew you out of my mouth, like you would do with the room temperature milk or room temperature Coca Cola or coffee. You want it hot or cold? Probably not Coca Cola. You want it cold, right? Um, he says, because you say I'm rich. A lot of people think this is talking to our church these days. These days, it's talking to the churches of earth this day. Um, it says, you say, I, I'm rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And uh, you would look at them on the outside from the eyes of the world and say, wow, that's blessed. Look at what all they have. Look at what all they got going on for them. But everything that they have and everything they have going on for them is stuff that is temporary and that will not last. So, yes, that's an earthly blessing, but it won't go into eternity. It's not going to store up treasures in heaven. He says, and then he says, and you don't realize that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. You don't realize it because sometimes we get blinded by our possessions. We get blinded by the other things that we think are truly blessings when the fulfillment of blessing the whole world is not just us having stuff. It's us having Jesus right here in our life, right here in our presence. So earthly blessings are temporary. I mean, think about people in the Bible that uh, Job in one day, I would say Job was blessed. I would say that what did God say about him? There's nobody on earth as righteous as Job. And in one day he lost everything. You see, in the eyes of the world, you would say, man, that's, that guy's cursed. He's not blessed. You know, even his wife looked at him and said, just curse God and die. But he wouldn't do it. You know, he's faithful. And uh, that's a heavy, heavy, heavy book to read that everybody should read. But it still goes to show earthly blessings are temporary. One day, man, your life can get turned upside down. Raise your hand if you've lost a loved one recently and your life got turned upside down or somebody was suffering or we all suffer under COVID-19 and other conditions and other things that will come in the future and things you suffered with in the past. Earthly things, they, they come and float with the breeze. They're they, they are temporary certain things that we go on and we need to find God's strength through his promises that will last forever. And we're looking into what does it truly mean to be blessed. Now in the Bible, in the whole Bible, the word blessed or blessing or blessed, it occurs over 302 times. In the New Testament, the word blessed, blessing or blessed, in that context, the word it occurs 112 times, and every single time it is used in the New Testament for us. It is used in the context of things that will last 
forever. It is never used in context of stuff that will just dissolve in time. It's never used in the context of stuff that will just dissolve or just fade away. It's always in the context of stuff that will last forever because we've been built to last. We've been given a faith that's been built to last and you are blessed to last. And what Jesus has done is forever. It's not about these temporary things. And if we take what God promised to Abraham and turn that into selfishness, man, we, we're going to lose in the end because those are things that will fade away. And so the Greek word here is, I'm going to say it, which is probably going to sound really wrong. You can search it on Google. It says Macarios. I'm saying it maybe with a sp Spanish pronunciation. Macarios. And look at this definition. Because I, this is the word that's used over and over in the Greek in the New Testament. It says to be fully satisfied. And we know all the things that we have in life. They can be good having a, a bigger house or a smaller house or a, a nice car. We want those things. Listen, there's nothing wrong with having those things. I, I would never say that. Like, have a house, get a car, get whatever you need in life. And I think God gives and supplies our need. It's just they are not the point. They, they are earthly blessings, but we know that they will fade. But you get a new house and then you, after you buy it and you start complaining about payments and then it's either too big or too small or then you got to clean it if it's too big. And, and then all of a sudden, if it's our house, you know, you know, we got uh, uh, um, iguanas that are showing up and now I got termites I was battling this week. It's, it's always going to be a battle for these temporary things that are not going to last. There's always something that's going to take away and it doesn't fully satisfy. I mean, are you ever going to get that pair of shoes that's so awesome that you never need to buy another pair of shoes in your life? No, because you get that. You wanted that pair of shoes for six months. Then you got it. A month later, you're like, eh, I need another pair. You get that car you wanted and, and you love it for a couple months. And you're like, I think I want a red one. <laughs> you know, if you have that kind of money or if you get this house, then you're like, well, I should have waited and bought that one. It's just hard for us to be fulfilled in the things of life. They're just temporary, but what Jesus has done is eternal and it's forever. So look at this definition again, to be fully satisfied, receiving God's favor, which you have in Jesus, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the circumstances. Now that is beautiful. You have God's favor through this promise, not through things, through Jesus. Don't ever make it just about things it goes back to Jesus, who we trust with our life, our blood, our sweat, our tears, and eternity, and in our death. That we can be fully satisfied, having His favor that He's already, the promises in Christ are yes to you for all these things, not just earthly things, regardless of the circumstances. Whether you suffer, whether somebody lost their life or not, which is a tragedy, but you can trust in the promises of God that God's got that under control. And that's a beautiful thing. I mean, you know the, the, the Beatitudes, man. Matthew chapter 5, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those, okay? It's almost like a twist, a play on the word, what we think is being blessed. You would think Jesus say, blessed are those who have a lot of money. Blessed are those who have big homes. Blessed are those who are always healthy. Blessed are those who are never sick. Blessed are those who never die. You know, like, um, he didn't say anything like that. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit. They're bankrupt and they know that they need God in their soul. How blessed are you to recognize that need? Blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted, not by the ways of this earth. They're blessed because God is the one that will bring their comfort in this very hard life that we live. Blessed are the meek because God put them under control. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be filled. And some versions even say they will be satisfied. How beautiful. He even goes, blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. Blessed are you when you are persecuted. Think about that. He doesn't say blessed is for just things of this life. It goes into an, an internal perspective in our relationship with God. But I know today that you have been blessed. You are blessed. Say that with me. I am blessed. You are blessed by God right now. The fulfillment of the promise made to Abraham is right here, right now, all over the world. Fulfill 
fulfilling itself in people's life. It's here because you want to know why? You've been blessed spiritually and bought through the blood, sweat, and tears of Jesus Christ. He already did it. While we were still sinners, Christ came and died for us. Not that we deserve it, earned it, not that we we did anything to gain that. It, It has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with how good God is. And I want you to know that you've been blessed by that, that God loves you. You've been blessed by adoption, that He brings us in, He buys us, He pulls us in as outsiders and brings us into the family of God. That now, because of what Christ has done, we can be called children of God. Because now we, we know that I've been adopted. I'm blessed spiritually. I'm blessed by adoption. I'm blessed by forgiveness. You are blessed by forgiveness. That door is always open. If you've never made the, the decision to follow Jesus Christ, you know there's never been a better time than right now that He calls you. He loves you. And that door is wide open to you for adoption. That he calls you, come to me, all of you are, are weary and carrying heavy burdens, man. And Jesus says, I will give you rest. Rest right in your soul, man, because he's so good. And it says, you know, what else? We're blessed by eternal life. Look what all he's given us. That's going to take an eternity for God to show you how much he loves you. But I put at the end of this little list, blessed by knowing that you can know this. You can rest assured in this blessed assurance, as some say. Because Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise. And I'm going to end with this text from Romans 4.18. It says, against all hope. All right? When, when things don't look like they're working out for us, when things, and for Abraham and Sarah, that definitely, they try to take matters in their own hand. I'm not going to get into that right now. But against all hope, and maybe you feel that right now, and you feel the pressure of life and all these things, while being blessed is right here because you are blessed by God. You know, because of what Jesus has done against all hope and all things that come against you, you can trust in the promises of God. You can be blessed today. And and I would say if there's anything you need to claim today is that blessing that Jesus is your Lord. He is the King of Kings that came here for you. And so this text says against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations, just as has been said to him so shall your offspring be. And I'm here to tell you today, you are blessed. You are blessed by God. He loves you. He calls you. You've been blessed as a son or a daughter of the King of Kings. All right. That doesn't mean everything in life will be peachy for us. It can get rough, but we know who has it under control and we know who knows how to fix it. And we know who's working on our very behalf. If you have anything we can pray for, please let us know. If you haven't accepted Jesus as your King of Kings and Lord of Lords, if you haven't been baptized, you want to make those kind of decisions, let us know in the comments or contact one of us. Man, we will certainly talk with you over that. And, um, and we love you guys. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for everything you do. I thank you for, for being the answer to that promise, not just stuff. And don't let us put our faith in just our time or our homes and our cars or our jobs and all these other things. Let us put our whole hope and our faith and trust in the promises you made all the way back to Abraham, which Jesus, you are the fulfillment of that promise. I pray that today we will trust that more than anything else because that is what's going to last in the end. That is what's going to take us through eternity. God, give us a heart that's pure and uh, let us know that we are already blessed by you and let us claim that even now in the name of Jesus. We love you guys. God bless every single one of you today. We look forward to seeing you in person soon. And so we hope that you know that you today are blessed. God bless you all. We love you.